do have, I know uh, Senator Blasey on WebEx. Keon, do we have anybody else on WebEx yet? Senator Holscher's on online. Two KLRD staff, and then Senator Fascado, not yet. Not yet. So we should have a, a couple more uh, members uh, filtering in. Just so uh, you know the overview of how we're going to do this so we uh, can do it in an efficient manner, um, I typically don't like to limit any one speaker's time, so I do this in blocks. I'll have a 20-minute block for proponents. Uh, just as the speakers come up, just be cognizant of the time of the speakers behind you. I'll probably just do five minutes for neutral, since they're neutral, and a 20-minute block for opponents. After each block of time, I will uh, allow questions from the committee, and then we'll move on, and we'll try to wrap this up hopefully in about 90 minutes or so. Uh, so I think to get started here, uh, Jason has eaten his Wheaties this morning. He's got the bill brief, and it may take a little bit of while, a little bit of time. So we'll turn it over to our revisor, Jason Long, to explain the bill. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Senate Bill 555 would create the Medical Cannabis Pilot Program Act uh, to establish a pilot program for cultivating, processing, uh, distributing, and sale and use and possession of medical cannabis in the state of Kansas. Uh, the program would be administered by the Secretary of Health and Environment, um, and the program does have a five-year uh, sunset on it, so it would go away on July 1st of 2029, if not uh, re-upped by the legislature. Um, how this one is structured is um, the pilot program would operate on a series of contracts between uh, the private entities that are participating and the Secretary for Health and Environment. Um, these would be contracts um, with up to four uh, entities that are referred to in the bill as medical cannabis operators or MCOs. Uh, the MCOs uh, would have to meet the criteria um, for participating in the program, and they would be permitted when they enter into the contract to cultivate and process medical cannabis and medical cannabis products, uh, which are those that are derived from um, the plant. Um, the privilege fee for participating in the pilot program would be $50,000 a year paid to the secretary. Um, they would have to, each contract would have to have uh, provisions in it that uh, comply with the provisions of the pilot program, so the Secretary would be bound by those parameters. Um, there is a requirement that each uh, director, uh, that a director, a manager, or an officer of each MCO would have to have held a hemp producer license under the Commercial Industrial Hemp Act for the two years preceding entering into the contract um, and have held a position as a director, manager, officer for that hemp producer uh, licensee um, for that two-year period. So we have um, some experience in the cannabis-related industry there as a prerequisite for entering into a contract. Uh, the contracts would be only valid for five years, the length of the pilot program initially. Um, the secretary would be authorized to unilaterally terminate the contract for a breach if there isn't a timely cure. Um, there is provision in the bill that would allow an MCO to at least commence cultivation of medical cannabis plants prior to entering into the contract with the secretary. If the secretary has issued a letter of intent to that MCO that it intends to enter into a contract uh, to operate uh, to be an MCO. And so there is uh, a provision to allow a, an early start to cultivation, if you will. Um, then that's the cultivation and processing side of things. With respect to dispensing the medical cannabis and medical cannabis products to patients and caregivers, uh, the program allows the secretary to contract with pharmacies located in the state. There is no limit on the number of those contracts. Uh, the pharmacies, and these are the pharmacies that you, that you think of as, as the pharmacies for dispensing prescription medication, uh, would be permitted to dispense medical cannabis and cannabis products through uh, what are called distribution hubs um, under the legislation. 
the pharmacy would pay a privilege fee of $500 each year uh, for this contract. It would again be valid for only five years. Um, there is a provision that if by September uh, 1st of this year, pharmacies are still precluded under federal regulation from dispensing cannabis products uh, as proposed under this legislation, then the secretary could uh, proceed with entering into contracts with its MCOs to operate distribution hubs. And each MCO would be allowed to operate up to seven distribution hubs uh, across the state. Um, again, that's only uh, that's a contingency if the pharmacies are still precluded at that date uh, from dispensing by federal uh, rule and reg. Um, the contract then also allows one additional um, contract, the secretary can contract with the private laboratory uh, for doing the quality assurance testing of all medical cannabis and medical cannabis products that are cultivated, processed, and sold uh, through the pilot program. And there are um, provisions in the legislation for the standards for that testing uh, and how that's to be conducted. Um, and the secretary is to work in conjunction with the private lab to further develop those uh, testing protocols and testing standards. Um, with respect to the facilities, there are provisions um, that provide uh, how a cultivation facility can operate with uh, limits on the square footage for the cultivating area, um, must be in completely enclosed and windowless, uh, can only be located on property that's zoned industrial, um, and it must pass an industrial safety and hygiene audit prior to beginning operation. Uh, similar, there are restrictions on processing facilities. We are taking the cannabis plant and processing it into medical cannabis products. Um, in terms of those facilities also have to be completely enclosed and secure. Uh, there are specifications under legislation as to what extraction methods um, can be used by the processors. Um, there are limits that you can only process medical cannabis products that are permitted to be sold to patients and caregivers under the act. You cannot process additional uh, medical cannabis products. Uh, an industrial safety and hygiene audit is also required for processing facilities uh, prior to beginning operation. And then there's a a provision under legislation that an MCO may contract with a licensed hemp processor under the Commercial Industrial Hemp Act to conduct the medical cannabis processing uh, for the MCO. And so there's a, a bit of a partnership uh, provision there that's allowed under Senate Bill 555. Um, with respect to the distribution hubs, um, each distribution hub uh, can acquire medical cannabis and cannabis products from any MCO. Um, and that includes an MCO that is running the distribution hub if we're into that contingency. Um, the distribution hub um, would require a valid certificate um, be presented by the patient or caregiver. These are the uh, certificates issued by the patient's physician um, recommending treatment with medical cannabis. Uh, the patient or caregiver must also show a valid ID at the time of purchase. Um, must, uh, the distribution hub would verify that the certificate matches the one that's sent by the patient's doctor. So when the doctor issues the certificate to the patient, um, they will designate the caregiver and they would also designate a, a primary distribution hub for that patient when they complete that and they would send a copy of the certificate to that distribution hub. So there's a paper trail and a, and a link there um, to follow. Um, only the authorized forms uh, could be dispensed um, and the distribution hub must comply with all packaging and labeling requirements um, as uh, prescribed under the legislation. Um, there is provision that uh, the transactions must be cashless and no credit cards would be permitted to be used to make these purchases. Um, essentially, the, the funding would operate on a pre-funded account basis. The patient or caregiver would have a pre-funded account with the distribution hub that would then be debited uh, for each um, purchase that is made. Um, there's also provisions uh, both for on-site 
purchases, and then the distribution hub may do uh, direct to home delivery to a patient or caregiver under the legislation, um, requiring criminal history record checks for those drivers, requiring security uh, camera systems to record all activities involved with the vehicles making these deliveries. That includes both uh, stocking up inventory on the vehicle prior to delivery and then making the deliveries themselves. Um, it does allow the distribution hub to contract with a third party delivery service for delivery of these products as well directly to the patient or caregiver. Um, there are requirements for security um, of these distribution hubs. This includes proper lighting, video monitoring, secured entrances, alarm systems, and training of staff um, on site. Um, and those are similar provisions to what have appeared in prior um, medical cannabis legislation. Um, with respect to the products themselves, there are limitations on what can be dispensed, pills or tablet form, tinctures, patches, ointments, and the cannabis flower itself. Those are the only permitted forms that may be dispensed. Um, with respect to advertising, uh, there's no advertising or signage of any kind permitted for the cultivation and processing facilities. Um, the pharmacies would simply have to abide by the no false or misleading information and their advertising uh, restrictions, but they wouldn't be otherwise restricted in terms of the placement or the type of signage that they are using uh, at their distribution hubs. Um, the patients and caregivers uh, must be at least 21 um, to get a, a valid medical certificate issued by the patient's doctor. Uh, the doctor reviews the patient's records, determine they suffer from one of the qualifying medical conditions. Um, those are laid out on page three of the bill, line 24, if you want to read through the e lengthy list of qualifying conditions. Um, Caregivers must be designated on the certificate um, along with the primary distribution hub, as I mentioned. Um, there is, uh, the patient can go to an alternative distribution hub if they need to. There just is uh, communication between the primary distribution hub and the alternative distribution hub as to the purchases that are made so that the patient doesn't exceed their 30-day allotment uh, that they can purchase. Um, uh, of medical cannabis, and that is specified in the bill at not more than 200 grams of medical cannabis or uh, an aggregate of 3.47 grams of THC and all the medical cannabis products that are purchased by the patient or caregiver. Um, there's also a provision directing the secretary to appoint five physicians um, in the state who would be available um, and willing to review medical patient history, diagnose qualifying conditions, and issue medical uh, cannabis certificates to those patients if the patient is having trouble securing a certificate from their primary phys care physician. Um, the doctors who issue these certificates would be immune from uh, any liability arising out of the issuance of such certificates. Uh, as because this is a pilot program, there is reporting requirements for MCOs and pharmacies to submit reports to the secretary on uh, the amount of cannabis and products that they've been handled, that have been purchased, cultivated, processed, and what have you by, by the entity. Uh, a description of the impact of the requirements of the program on their business operations and recommendations for improving the program. And then each year, the secretary is submitting a report based on the reports it receives from its contractors. It submits a report report to the governor and legislature, including that information and recommendations from the secretary on improvements to the program. Uh, there is a taxation, um, an excise tax of 8% uh, on the medical cannabis and medical cannabis products. 20% um, of the tax revenues from that excise tax are to be uh, put into medical cannabis research and education through a, a designated fund that's administered by the secretary. Uh, the remainder then goes into the state general fund. And then there are a number of provisions that, if you've read enough of these bills, will seem familiar to you. Um, the usual exemptions from the criminal code provisions for possession manufacturing of controlled substances uh, are all in the bill. And then there are a number of provisions that are also similar um, 
uh, like the seed to sale tracking system that is to be used by the cultivators, processors, and the uh, distribution hubs for tracking the product, uh, criminal history checks for all owners, directors, officers, managers, employees of the contractors, um, uh, exemption from criminal liability for financial institutions, uh, Provisions to allow law enforcement agencies to acquire the information to verify the validity of medical cannabis certificates, uh, either with the patient's uh, physician or with the distribution hub. Exemptions from uh, for academic research centers from the requirements of the program so they can conduct their, their research on medical cannabis. Um, an employer could enforce a, a, a workplace drug policy under the bill. Uh, there is a crime that you've, you've likely seen before on unlawful storage of medical cannabis um, that allows access by a minor. Those provisions are in the bill. Um, there are provisions that protect a patient or caregiver from being prosecuted for federal firearm violations if the illegal substance that's the basis for the firearm violation is a medical cannabis. Uh, the usual non-discrimination provisions, so you can't discriminate against a patient for use of medical cannabis with respect to qualifications for an organ transplant um, and child custody and support orders, workers' compensation benefits. Um, those provisions have been in previous legislation or in Senate Bill 555. And then the provisions that uh, protect uh, medical health care providers uh, from disciplinary actions for being involved in um, patient care um, and issuance of certificates to treat with medical cannabis. Uh, those are in the bill as well. Well, again, it goes into effect this July 1st, I believe. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, we did change it at the last minute before the bill was introduced. It's actually effective on Kansas Register, um, so the secretary can begin those negotiations with potential MCOs uh, sooner than July 1st. Um, but then it does have a five-year sunset on July 1 of 2029. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Jason, you did it faster than I expected. <laughs> Thought it would take about 25 minutes. Uh, thank you for that comprehensive overview. Uh, committee, any questions for Jason? That was quite extensive. Mr. Senator Chairman. Straub. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Straub and then Senator Fauscado. Um, thank you, Jason. And um, let me see here. Uh, I know it says that they would be exempt from the Kansas Criminal Code, but would the Kansas Board of Pharmacy rules and regulations apply, or how how does that work? Um, so there are provisions in the bill for the medical providers issuing the medical certificates. Um, I don't recall any provisions specifically addressing the Board of Pharmacy and their rules and regs with respect to the pharmacies that are contracting under this. If the pharmacies aren't precluded by federal regulation from dispensing these products, I don't know if there's anything in rules and regs that would also preclude them, but I would have to, I w we can certainly look into that. Senator Fasquedo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jason, uh, two quick questions. Um, so, would the pharmacist be required to have any additional license? If so, what? And again, the entities, the those that are um, uh, making the distributions, did you say that they would have to have been in business or you mentioned hemp for two years? Would you restate that? Sure. So the only requirement under the legislation for the pharmacies is that they enter into a contract with the secretary and pay the privilege fee of $500 each year. There would be no additional licensure or other requirements that they'd have to go to like the Board of Pharmacy to get in order to participate in the program under this legislation. Uh, with respect to the uh, your second question, um, for the MCOs um, that are cultivating and processing the medical cannabis, um, 
a director, manager, or officer of the MCO would have to have held a hemp producer license under the Commercial Industrial Hemp Act for the two years prior to entering into the agreement with the secretary under the pilot program. So that's the two-year hemp producer requirement um, for those MCO contractors. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Holscher, up next. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the overview. Um, I do have two different questions. I wanna go back to that um, part with the pharmacies being uh, the distributors. And what was that trigger date in terms of, I know that's not allowed currently because of the scheduling uh, through the DEA. So what was that trigger date? And if rescheduling doesn't happen by then, where, what happens to the distribution method? Sure. So the trigger date is September 1st um, would be the date the secretary would look at to see if, if there's been a change in the scheduling at the federal level. If there is no change by September 1st, then the secretary is free to then contract with its MCOs, the cultivator processor entities, could then enter into additional agreements with the secretary to operate the distribution hubs, which would then dispense medical cannabis to patients and caregivers. Um, and there's a limit, each MCO could only operate up to seven distribution hubs under that scenario. Okay, may I do a follow up, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so contracting would then fall to the same four that are the processors. That's correct. Okay. And then um, I do have another question on a, a different topic. Uh, so I don't know if you want to go to other people, Chair, or do you want me to go ahead? Go right ahead and then we'll move on. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand this bill that there's just a few methods of uh, forms of the product that are available. Smoking is not allowed, but the flower is allowed. So my question is this, what happens when, you know, somebody has a flower and they decide to essentially assemble the product to smoke themselves? What penalties apply to them? Uh, there are no um, specific um, penalty provisions with respect to unlawful usage other than um, the criminal penalty, the criminal exemptions from the criminal code are predicated on usage and possession in accordance with the pilot program. So if your use and possession falls outside what is permitted under the pilot program, you're potentially putting your criminal liability exemption in jeopardy. Okay, and that liability falls to the user, nothing to the processors or distributors? Uh, only to the extent that their conduct would uh, fall outside the pilot program. If their own conduct as a cultivator or processor or dispensary falls outside the uh, parameters of the pilot program, they would also potentially have criminal liability at that point because their exemption, like I said, is predicated on them acting in accordance with the pilot program. Okay, so the end user basically is subject to all the regular laws we have now in terms of unlawful usage. There's no exemptions in this bill. They have exemptions, but only to the extent that they are possessing and using medical cannabis in accordance with the pilot program. Gotcha, okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, committee, other questions? I have a couple, uh, Jason. Uh, it says on uh, the bottom of page 13, uh, that the cannabis shall not contain more than 35% THC, but then also says cannabis with more than 35% can be processed into cannabis products or destroyed. So it sounds like even though there appears to be a limit, there's really not. Any clarification on that? Uh, my understanding on that provision is if the medical cannabis is tested and found to have a THC content that's higher than 35%, then it would go back through more processing potentially to be remediated so that it can it get below that allowable percentage or it would have to be destroyed if that's not possible. I didn't see anything in the bill that dealt with uh, oversight of the destruction of that material. Did you 
No, I don't. Uh, I don't recall that this uh, piece of legislation has extensive parameters with respect to uh, destruction of medical cannabis waste. Um, there are provisions from other legislation. I don't know that those made it into Senate Bill 555. Then with regard to uh, the distribution, third-party distribution, we don't even allow that for alcohol here in the state right now. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. So it, in other words, theoretically, these, let's say the pharmacies dropped out because there was no delisting and it's these four producers and the secretary would con would allow them to contract with third party delivery services it's theoretical you could have uber eats or anybody delivering directly to someone's home correct as the, long as they conform to the as long as the mco operating the distribution hub complies with the requirements for doing third party deliveries for doing delivery direct to patient and caregivers yes they can contract with any third party <laughs> delivery service to perform those functions any other questions i want i i have a number of them here but with regard to these exemptions one that troubles me is on new section 31 page 39 if the sole basis, uh, no order shall be issued pursuant to KSA 382422 and a couple other statutes. If the sole basis for the threat to the child's safety or welfare is that the child resides with an individual who consumes medical cannabis or medical cannabis products, uh, this, this basically gives them, so they go before a court for a child safety hearing somebody has one of these certificates so we assume that they're using cannabis with product levels of up to 35 percent thc so the court could not take into consideration the child's safety and welfare that's how i read this would that be correct the court could not take into consideration the parent or, or guardian's use of medical cannabis in accordance with the pilot program. So the fact that they have been issued a certificate for treatment with medical cannabis, the fact that they possess and use medical cannabis as allowed under the pilot program would not be a factor in the court's determination as to the best interests of the child and ordering support or custody uh, to the extent the parent or legal guardian is uh, using or possessing medical cannabis that's not in accordance with the pilot program, then that would be allowed to be uh, considered by the court. It's, it's, it's like the criminal liability exemption, it's predicated on the fact that the parent or legal guardian is possessing and using in accordance with the pilot program. And the same question kind of goes to the workman's comp piece. Uh, can you explain that exemption? Because if somebody were using uh, the, the cannabis and on the job may have been cognitively impaired as an accident, then we still have to pay out workman's comp, correct? Yes, yes, and again, it, it, again, that protection is again predicated on the possession and use in accordance with the pilot program, and so that's the, that's the caveat with those uh, statutory protections. Okay, committee, any other questions, Senator Erickson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jason, on page eleven, lines thirty-eight through forty-one, distribution hubs are required to take quote reasonable measures to prevent theft and diversion of cannabis and cannabis products. Can, can you clarify what constitutes reasonable measures? Um, I think that would most likely be a discussion between the secretary and the MCOs as to what um, the secretary as the state's contracting entity would consider to be reasonable. Um, in legal terms, it's typically what a reasonable per, reasonable person would think would be, you know, not leaving the doors unlocked, or in this case, because there are security requirements for the facilities, having those in good working order and not, you know, uh, operating in a way that would seem unreasonable um, for the proper functioning of those security systems. Um, for like, like, 
um, if you have um, security alarm systems not um, allowing your employees to turn those off, you know, at various times during the day, you know, things like that that would seem not particularly reasonable, but Honestly, this is going to be a more fact-specific inquiry with each facility and be a discussion between the secretary and the contracting MCO as to what um, steps and protections the MCO has to take to secure the facilities. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Jason. We appreciate it. We'll move on to our proponent testimony now. And again, I'll start the clock for 20 minutes, and we'll get through as many as we can. Up uh, first is Sam Jones, Samuel Jones from Kansas Natural Remedies. Sam, I'll start the clock. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. Appreciate you all taking time uh, to have this hearing. I, uh, I know that we're down to the line here. So um, it, we've been speaking with every member of the committee. We have heard the concerns. We've addressed those concerns. We looked at the bill that uh, we advocated for last year, and rather than trying to convince you that medical cannabis was the right thing for Kansas, we listened to the concerns and we addressed those concerns in the bill. So uh, our goal here is to provide relief to Kansas patients that are suffering from PTSD, arthritis, uh, cancer, severe pain, and these have legitimate medical uses as identified by the Food and Drug Administration. They issued a report that became public in January acknowledging that there are legitimate medical uses for medical cannabis. So our goal is to provide relief for patients while also balancing the concerns of legislators and conservative Kansans. So Kansas is one of 10 states that doesn't have a medical program. I don't know if you know this, but Texas has a medical program. It allows for people with PTSD to get medical cannabis. And so by being one of the last states to implement this, I think we've learned from other states. We've seen what they've done right. We've seen what they've done wrong. And we've tailored this bill to address the things that other states have gotten wrong and to address the things that they may have gotten right. This is a limited bill. This is supposed to be a pilot program. This is a proof of concept for medical cannabis to give uh, proof that medical cannabis isn't gonna cause the end of society. It's, it's not harming patients. It's not killing people. It's, the toxicity level of, of cannabis is so low, you couldn't reasonably kill yourself if you used enough of it, it's, it's impossible. So I want to I want to direct attention to the pharmacists. I mean, we've engaged the pharmacists in this program because I've been asked again and again, well, if this is a medical program, why aren't the pharmacists involved? Well, the pharmacists are involved now, and we agree. If this is a medical product, it should be dispensed by the pharmacists because the pharmacists are going to know the drug interactions, they're going to have the relationship with the patient, and they're going to be able to direct on the proper usage of this. There are a couple questions that I'd like to address. So flour is allowed to be purchased under the bill. Now, we took out all the forms of consumption that are not supported by a medical basis or would otherwise be dangerous. So gummies are not allowed under the bill. Any form of cannabis that could potentially have inadvertent consumption by a child, those aren't in the bill. Flour is in the bill. And the reason flour is in the bill, while you can't smoke it, and this is a lesser known fact, there's something called dry herb atomization, where you heat the flour to a non-combustible level and it atomizes the cannabinoids in that. And you inhale it, you exhale it. It doesn't smell like smoke. It's the fastest way for patients to get relief. It doesn't have the same impact that smoking has, which smoking increases your chance for heart attack or stroke for 30 minutes afterwards. Atomization doesn't have that effect. It's more like a nebulizer, uh, as it would be known in a, in a other medical setting. So um, I'd like to point out uh, how this interacts with law enforcement. I know law enforcement are gonna be concerned that they pour, pull somebody over and how are they to know if this is medical cannabis or illegal use? In this bill is a bright line Fourth Amendment search and seizure provision so that if the patient does not have the cannabis in a pharmacy sealed bag, then it is not legal possession. And the, the law enforcement officer can identify immediately whether or not that's the case. 
And we put that in there because we didn't want to create ambiguity for police officers during traffic stops. And we wanted to make their jobs as easy as possible with this new thing that we're implementing in Kansas. Uh, I want to talk about delivery. So delivery, uh, it, it's we need to balance the needs to keep this restrictive and to avoid the issues we've seen in other states while still giving patients access to this. There, it, it, we are not going to be able to provide product to the western side of the state to patients out there without some sort of delivery mechanism. And we're not talking about Uber Eats, we're not talking about uh, Grubhub, we're talking about Kansas-based delivery systems that have vehicle tracking, that do background checks on their drivers, that have cameras in their vehicle that monitor what's going in and out of those, uh, those delivery vehicles. And there are, and we've talked to at least one delivery group that does all these things. They deliver pharmaceutical drugs currently, and they're ready and able to do this while still being restrictive and preventing access to the black market. Uh, I wanted to talk about the child safety hearing. So it, if, a, if a parent was to go to a child safety hearing and they were negligent in any regard, and the court determined that it was because of their use of medical cannabis, that still would not prevent the parent from losing that child hearing because it's just the fact that they have the recommendation by the doctor. They can't use that alone to determine whether or not the child should be uh, taken away. But taken with the totality of the circumstances, they can look at the effects that maybe the parent had, uh, had done something because of their use. That would still be okay. And workman, workman's comp, there, there's a provision in the bill that allows businesses to still implement a drug, a workplace drug policy, so that if you're an engineer or a contractor and you need to test drug free, then businesses can still do that. And so that, it, it, we're, we're not gonna force businesses to allow medical cannabis in the workplace. And that's not what, what this bill does. I, at the end of the day, we, we listen to your concerns. And we crafted this bill based on your concerns. And we feel like this is the most restrictive, comprehensive program, addresses the, the concerns that you've had while still giving access to patients. Having the pharmacists on board, we've got the executive director from the Kansas Pharmacists Association here, Jerry Holroyd. Um, they're excited to do this. And it just makes sense. If this is a medical program, it needs to go through pharmacists. Um, so what we're trying to do, give relief to patients while still addressing the concerns that you have about medical cannabis. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam. Up next is Michael Snyder, and we're about seven minutes deep, so you've got about 13 minutes left in the 20-minute block. Michael Snyder. Thank you, Chairman Thompson and members of the committee. My name is Michael Snyder. I'm a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel, having served 22 years, and I'm a proponent in favor of SB 555. I'm here today on behalf of the 155,000 uh, veterans in Kansas and to advocate for each Kansan who has served our armed forces and nation. We serve all for one and, and one for all. Today there's one person contemplating suicide. Today there's one person taking opioids when they might not need to. So many of my military friends returned to the states from foreign wars changed, physical issues, emotional issues, suicidal. I will not stand by and watch my friends suffer while a few reluctants refuse to hear us and decide without compromise what is good for our veterans. There is a gap in our medical regimen. Today in Kansas, when someone is in pain, what do they get prescribed? Opioids. A year ago, I went to the ER for some heart issues, and they prescribed me aspirin laced with fentanyl. I actually wondered, fentanyl? I don't want fentanyl. This is the same drug that is killing people on a daily basis. I don't want fentanyl. They said it was medical grade. So I said, well, I guess I'm so glad it's not off the street. At least that's a benefit. What I'm saying is that veterans and so many others don't have the benefit of options. Options like medical cannabis, not smoked, not a gummy, just like any other prescription. Why is medical cannabis an issue? Because half of Americans have used cannabis. They're familiar with it. So we debate it, because we're familiar with it. 
we fear monger and we hear the same arguments. It's a gateway drug. And you know, it's funny. Well, what about alcohol, right? And what about nicotine? <laughs> Cannabis, how's, how can they be worse than those things that we already have? It's, um, if it, is a person more likely to become addicted and overdose on opioids or cannabis? There's a reason we know the term opioid epidemic, and there's a reason why you've never heard the term cannabis epidemic. We are talking about a new drug that can benefit hundreds of thousands of Kansans suffering from horrible, horrible things, epilepsy, Tourette's. Like 20,000 people in Kansas have Tourette's. It's amazing. Cancer, military vets with PTSD. These aren't stoners or druggies. These are real people who are in real pain. They don't currently have the option between using an incredibly dangerous and addictive drug, opioids, or a drug that allows them relief, isn't cripplingly addictive, and doesn't isolate them from their friends and family, and that's medical cannabis. Medical cannabis is a lesser evil to opioids. Opioids kill. No one has ever OD'd on medical cannabis. In fact, our own Kansas Health Institute reported that medical cannabis has been shown to reduce opioid use. So the real question is, what is our state's strategy for reducing opioids? Why are we con so concerned about medical cannabis when Kansans are dying every day from overdosing on a prescribed narcotic that turns patients into addicts? This is the real issue. What is Kansas's strategy for reducing opioid use? Opioid addiction resulting from opioid prescriptions. I've never heard of the legislature taking a stand and voting against opioid use in Kansas. Yet here we are debating this. A vote against medical cannabis is a vote for continued opioid prescription addiction, overdose, and needless suffering. Yes, Kansas is one of 10 states. We haven't given you know, our, our, our citizens the opportunity uh, to have and use medical cannabis. I've read the bill, and it gives, it's tight. This is not like uh, uh, Oklahoma or Missouri with dispensaries in every corner. Instead, this bill fills an existing gap in patient treatment to reduce opioid use. As legislators, as legislators and representatives of Kansans in your district need to know that this issue is not about fear or certainly recreational use or appeasing the voter base. It's about reducing opioid prescription use and abuse. It's about Kansas adopting a smart, stringent policy on medical cannabis. It's about helping hundreds of thousands of real people, not only the veterans that I want to advocate for, but real mothers and fathers and uncles and teachers who have serious issues, and this will lend to their productivity economically, socially. I mean, it's going to make their lives materially better. Now, you should know something. I'm not from Kansas. I've lived in New York. I've lived in Colorado. I've lived in Oklahoma. I've lived in Missouri. I chose to settle down in Kansas because there's something about Kansas. It's wholesome. It embodies the best of America, and I truly believe that. Kansas has a common sense about it, and now I know we're amongst the last of the 10 states to take a position, but I believe that this state is wise. We are in a position to learn from all the mistakes other people have made, and now is the time. This is a tight bill. You really can't get a tighter bill. Um, and medical cannabis is not going away. At some point, we're going to have to make a decision, right? We need to take a position on this new and evolving treatment. So I say let's set the national standard on this issue. Let's let this state be the state that others emulate. So I ask you, please overcome the slippery slope fallacies on this issue, and let's pass this bill. It's time for Kansas to set the standard. I ask that you vote yay in SB 555. And just to remember to not vote in favor of this bill is to vote for continued over-reliance on opioids. And this is a real strategy to get past that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Up next, Steve Beamer, uh, base of me, uh, wellness dispensaries. And we've got about uh, six and a half minutes left. Is Stephen here? I do not see Stephen. Uh, is, or next up is Nicholas Reinecker. Is Nicholas here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Reinecker from Inman, Kansas, and I am a proponent to Senate Bill 555 because it represents a baby step in uh, cannabis liberty. The current situation in Kansas is this. There are lots of cannabis dispensaries around Kansas selling unregulated uh, products made by uh, CBD oil or whatever synthetic derivatives 
from the cannabis plant that uh, are not uh, natural and they are being sold to who, whoever wants to buy them at the uh, gas station. Meanwhile, you're not allowing the natural plant uh, to be allowed for people. Now, I, I am an opponent or a proponent to this bill, but I do have some issues with it that I think need to be changed, especially when it comes to gun rights. If you're going to allow somebody to uh, use cannabis, I think you should also uh, support their gun rights and not just have it be sunset. So today we're going to support your gun rights, and then in five years, as you're taking this cannabis, we're not going to support your gun rights. So I think that the, that needs uh, to be fixed. Um, the past uh, opponents have mentioned that uh, Sativex is an option when it is not. Um, it is not approved by the FDA, and the problem with uh, medications that are made uh, that are FDA approved, they don't have the entourage effect, and they don't provide the relief that the natural cannabis can do. Also, in past um, opponent testimony, uh, the director of the KBI mentioned that he can't test uh, plant material past 2%, but then he says also in the same testimony that he's seen lab reports uh, up to 35%. So there's just some issues that, that need to be, I, I mean, I'm an American, I'm a Kansan, and we're all here fighting about a plant. Meanwhile, Chinese weather balloons and all these other things are, are going on when we can't get together and say, hey, people should have access uh, to medical cannabis, especially, uh, when we as a state, we have state-owned gambling, dependence for alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceutical campaign contributions. We're currently a regional abortion distribution hub. So the absurdity and hypocrisy that continued cannabis prohibition that is used as a gateway to the criminal justice and behavioral system, for profit or not, is akin to proper medical or public health and safety policy is, is, is just that absurd. Um, so. A few other issues in the deal. Um, any, anybody who's using the word marijuana right now, in my opinion, is a globalist and is worried about us uh, with the international treaties and the like. And so uh, I'm glad that we're using the word cannabis. I do think that the uh, passage of this bill is, is just a one small step into good cannabis liberty. There are plenty of people who want to talk, but um, you know, in my 10 years of experience coming here, the games that are being played with this plant is just ridiculous. And I, and I hope that we can get past the bickering and fighting, learn some true conservative principles that are limited government, individual liberty, uh, free, fair markets, open markets, not all this big government stuff. So yes, I support the bill because it's, it's uh, a step in the right direction to true constitutional cannabis, regardless of whether you say recreation or not. Uh, you have my testimony. I thank you for allowing me to speak. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Nick. Uh, up next is Dr. Chad Issinghoff, and uh, we've got about two and a half minutes. Um, Senator Thompson, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to be here today. <clears throat> I'm Kansas born, Kansas educated. I practiced pediatrics in Hutchison for 34 years and retired in 2020. Uh, as a physician, I try to take a nonpartisan view to this uh, particular issue. And I think we can all agree that medical cannabis is not a panacea. And at the same time, I think we can all agree that medical cannabis does not open the Pandora's box to, to increasing social ills. So the question becomes, does medical cannabis have a place in the spectrum of medical care? And I would have to say it's a qualified yes. I think that the entities listed in the bill are, are a good start. There needs to be ways to, to increase those or to add on to those as, as needed. But medical cannabis serves as an adjuvant and not a replacement for conventional medical therapy. I believe that it serves as an alternative form, in some cases, having the potential to help patients, number one, continue to function in a reasonable fashion, and secondly, it decreases the use of medications with more addictive potential, and, per, and in particular, more numerous or serious side effects and interfere with uh, everyday living. As a lifelong Kansan, I find it disconcerting that people who would benefit from medical cannabis must often make a choice. They can either forego 
treatment that may help, may help alleviate their symptoms, or they have to run the risk of going to a surrounding state and risk criminal prosecution if caught. For the um, sake of brevity, I think there are questions that need to be answered concerning physician qualification for recommending cannabis, patient protection, particularly with uh, parents. There's, gonna, there's addiction questions, and then there's the use in, in uh, the pediatric population. I know that the, the, there are two defined um, instances where uh, cannabis is, is uh, recommended or, or, in fact, is a treatment of choice in two specific uh, seizure, seizure syndromes. Sorry, we're, uh, we're just about out of time, so. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Appreciate it. It's 20 minutes. Okay, committee. Um, we have, we missed Jake Anderson, couldn't get to Jake. We do have some proponent written only testimony by Byron McNeil and Jared Holroyd. And I'm going to open it up now to questions for any of the proponents. Uh, Senator Cluse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just a couple of questions for two different individuals. Samuel, if you would come, thank you for your testimony today. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you speak, what I hear a lot is about the uh, content limit, THC, uh, in the medical cannabis products. Um, I remember when we were in a joint meeting concerning Oklahoma, you made reference uh, today about uh, the gummy worms. Mm -hmm. and we heard about some kids uh, in Oklahoma, some children that got into gummy worms and the effects that it had. Uh, can you speak a little bit more to that content limit? So uh, the way that uh, THC content in medical cannabis products and the flower works is in the flower, it's a percentage basis because you, you have a fixed weight and a percentage of that is tetrahydrocannabinol. In products, they don't break it out by percentage. They break it out in milligrams. So what, by restricting the number of grams that a patient can purchase, we're restricting the amount of dosage that they can purchase with a medical cannabis program. Um, the THC limit is, is intended to be in there to keep this from going higher and higher and higher, which we've seen happen over the years. Um, while at the same time, we don't want to uh, cause uncertainty with cannabis operators like we do with hemp, where if they test over a certain amount, then they have to destroy the product. What we allow for this is they process any t uh, flour that goes over the limit, they process that into oil, and then that's broken up into dosages for uh, for cannabis products. So it, it may seem like it's going over the limit, but through the processing, you're actually breaking it out into individual doses for patients. So following up, so that would be the reason why you're tr saying that they couldn't overdose on something like this? It, it, people, the, the worst you can see with uh, medical cannabis is through gummies typically because um, they'll take some, They'll wait a little bit. They won't feel a thing. They'll take some more, and then it kicks in, and then all of a sudden they're having a panic attack. They think they're dying. and uh, the But the worst outcome, medical outcome for cannabis, is called cannabinoid-induced hyperemis, which is uncontrollable vomiting. It's essentially your body trying to reject what you've taken as being too much for the body to handle. So, uh, And uh, I know Brian McNeil. He's, he's the one that wrote the testimony. Uh, he's, a, he's a trauma surgeon. He's, he's very uh, accomplished. And I've asked him what he sees, and he says, once a month I get this cannabinoid-induced hyperemis, hook them up to an IV, they're fine. It's so, people aren't ODing and dying from cannabis. The only cannabis deaths that have, been, that have happened have been because of vaping, in New York because they've mixed other compounds in with the vape juice. We're not allowing vaping in this bill and we're not allowing smoking and we're not allowing gummies. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Senator, Senator Blasey uh, is up next and then Senator Fascado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is, I thought Sam, I thought you said there was an FDA study or something released in January. If you could send that to the committee, I would uh, appreciate that. 
And my next question is, um, in terms of the pharmacies, I thought you said there was a pharmaceutical representative in the room. How does, I'm curious how pharmacists and providers don't run afoul with federal DEA license requirements if they're prescribing an illegal scheduled one substance. So if anybody can, pharmacy world, help me understand that. Uh, so I, I can actually, I can answer that if that's all right. Senator Blasey. Um, so the FDA issued a report in August rec recommending to the DEA that cannabis be rescheduled from a Schedule One drug to a Schedule Three. And that determination is based on two factors. One, does it have a currently acceptable, accepted medical use, which they determined it does? And two, is it more or less dangerous than other scheduled drugs? To give you a frame of reference, fentanyl is a Schedule Two drug. So based on DEA scheduling, cannabis is more dangerous than fentanyl. So with that report, which was made, it was kept quiet, it was issued in August, it was kept quiet, and it was made public in January. With that report becoming public, it's imminent, it seems imminent that at the federal level, they're going to reschedule this as a Schedule Three, and that opens the door for pharmacies to be able to dispense this. Other states have done this. We're not the first. Georgia's done it, and they did receive a letter from the DEA, but they're fighting it after this, uh, this FDA report. And South Carolina is passing uh, legislation that allows pharmacies to dispense medical cannabis as well. Senator Fascado and then Senator Straub. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Samuel, you're, you're still in the hot spot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Happy to be here. So I, I appreciate you, your partners, and everyone else over the years who have brought this legislation to try and help relieve uh, pain for Kansans. Um, and, but Mr. Chairman, what my question is, while we are um, providing that pain relief in this legislation, is there any language in the bill, I forgot to ask Jason this question, um, that allows for uh, a percentage of minorities who would like to uh, participate, to cultivate, and um, just to be that in entity of distribution? Uh, Senator, there is there is not a uh, social equity provision in this bill. And, and our intent with this bill is to um, to provide proof of concept for medical cannabis. If this goes well, then we can implement a restrictive but more comprehensive medical cannabis bill. And at that time, I think a social equity provision would be appropriate. I appreciate that. So if we move forward on the legislation, we might be able to amend some of that language in there because uh, years ago, uh, one of our colleagues, Representative Gail Finney, uh, first um, introduced uh, cannabis um, medical marijuana at that time, and now we're calling it um, cannabis um, um, legislation. Um, you know, she had lupus, and uh, so she really believed in the concept. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have several questions. So if you need to pass over and come back to me, I'd appreciate I'll it. Go right ahead. This is for Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, there was an article in the Wichita Eagle on March 10th, mm -hmm. and I would like to get your feedback or some additional information on some of the things that were in the article. In the article, it states that for the past three years, your company has lobbied for more broad medical marijuana legislation, but this year you changed your tactic. You said it's clear that this strategy is not working. So you and your lobbyist, Michael O'Donnell, are appealing directly to leery conservative legislators and their constituents with a pilot program to give proof of concept. And then it gives a quote from you. Quote, we're putting this together to potentially pave the way for a more fully realized medical cannabis program. Can you explain to me what you, this bill is paving the way for? What is your intent down the road, Mr. Jones? So I, I know where that leads. 
we're there's no appetite for recreational cannabis in Kansas. The, it's going to happen at the federal level before it ever happens in Kansas. What we're looking for, and part of the criticisms that have been part of this bill, is that there's four operators allowed under this bill. And so what we're trying to do with such a limited number of operators is so that demand is here, supply is here. Almost every single state has overshot demand with supply. And what happens when that happens is product ends up in the black market. What we're trying to do is we're trying to ease supply up to the demand line so that we don't overshoot it. So what I mean by that is we have four operators currently, but we'll take a very deliberate approach to include more operators as this moves forward so that we're able to meet the demands of, uh, of patients. If I may. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. That's a great segue into my second question, um, the demand line, because in the article it also says that um, when you put together a business plan, it quickly evolved from simply cultivating hemp to advocating for medical marijuana. After hemp growing was legalized in 2018, you said the financials fell apart and they dropped precipitously and became less economically viable. According to the fiscal note that we received on this, Mr. Jones, if 15,000 Kansans is what the estimate is, pay 1,800 a year for this pilot program. That leads to revenue of $27 million. We just heard in previous proponent testimony that there's likely hundreds of thousands of Kansans that would be uh, wanting this product, the demand line as you speak. So let's just say that increases to 150,000 Kansans. That's $270 million for four distributors or producers. And by the way, the fiscal note also says that the cost to the state of Kansas for this is 15,500,000. ,000. So help me understand the demand line and what is, in your words, economical viability of medical, so-called medical marijuana? So there's a lot to unpack there. So first of all, uh, hemp, when, when we got into hemp, when we started exploring hemp, uh, it was new, the market was great, um, many operators jumped on the bandwagon, and what happened in hemp has happened in other medical cannabis states where there were too many producers and the price per pound fell at the bottom. Uh, we don't, these are all figures that we're guesstimating about. We don't know how many patients are going to be part of this program. We can have an idea, but also keep in mind that our company is producing the cannabis. This is also going through pharmacists. So our company is not going to be the only one benefiting economically from the 27 million. It's going to be independent pharmacists in small towns. We're, we're not looking to corner the market here. What we're trying to do is allow patients to get relief, allow our business to be able to operate, and give an opportunity for, for pharmacists to participate in the economic benefits. We're not the only companies that are going to see the economic benefit here. I, the, in other states, it's not just the, the cannabis operators. It's contractors. It's accountants. It's attorneys. This this is a rising tide that is going to benefit businesses that will never directly participate in the cannabis industry. Um, and then as far as the fiscal note, I, I would have to see that. I've been talking to the KDHE about the fiscal note and making sure that this program pays for itself. And uh, we would be happy to address any of those uh, concerns in conference committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The fiscal note I received definitely shows the state being on the hook for this. So thank you. I will Thanks. save my additional questions for later. Okay. Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Jones. I believe my question is probably for um, Dr. Issingoff, maybe. Um, so synthetic, I, I, well, first of all, I think we're all here to learn today, and I'm not sure that we're ready to take a test. So I'm trying to do a little bit of study here. Sure. Um, sy synthetic cannabinoids um, can, can actually harm your, cause, harm your health, and this is from the CDC, um, and it says synthetic cannab cannabinoids um, can even cause seizures. So do we have any research that naturally derived cannabinoids um, 
actually help seizure activity? And is, the, is your testimony based off of research that you have read, or is that based on personal experience? Um, it's, it, what I've said is based on research. The, the two kinds of seizures that cannabis is approved for are Lennox Gasto and Devon syndrome, which are, are fairly rare. Uh, sometimes synthetic cannabis is used for uh, an, as an anti-nausea drug in chemotherapy in, in kids that don't tolerate the normal drugs. I think the, the idea with synthetics, and this is my opinion, is that it, they don't have the entourage effect that natural occurring cannabis has. You know, there are interactions with THC and the CBDs and the, the, the 200 some odd other compounds in cannabis that probably have some interaction together that cause for effect. Now, I'm not convinced that um, there may be some issue, there may be some patients with seizures who would benefit, but that would not be a standard of care. That would be a extreme. Oh, sure. Thank you, and Mr. We'll, Chair. We'll um, just move on. one follow-up. Do you mm -hmm. think that um, that this bill is the best way to to research and and find out what really works for medical cannabis? I'm not sure that any other states have previously done it correctly, and I think Kansas's hesitation is because we've seen so many fail before us. We're just still slow to pull the trigger because we don't know what's going to happen. Sure. I think, you know, I think the, the good thing in Kansas is we have uh, a prominent agricultural college and a prominent medical school that can do the research to take a look at this. The problem in the United States is somewhat limited by, um, by federal law and that they, they cannot, I mean, they have to use a specific strain of cannabis and there are hundreds more now. So I think it's, it's, it would be a, a good idea. I think that's one of the things I think that would be profitable in this bill. Thank All righty. You. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and move on to, because for sake of time here, I think, is what we're going to do. Um, and so we'll move on to a neutral oral testimony. And Travis Aller up first. I'm going to give a neutral five minutes. Travis. Good morning, Chairman Thompson and members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present neutral testimony on SB 555. My name is Dr. Travis Aller. I'm the executive director of the Kansas Chiropractic Association which represents over 1,200 chiropractors in the state of Kansas and their patients. Um, you have my testimony in front of you. I'm not going to read it. And in the interest of time, um, I feel we feel that doctors of chiropractic should be included in the, those who can make the recommendation. We have three prohibitions on our scope of practice. We can't practice surgery. We can't practice obstetrics. And we can't prescribe medication. And in this bill, medical cannabis is not medication. Um, therefore, we feel like we should be included. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions as you have them, um, but I won't waste or I won't take up too much more of your time, so I'll stand for questions when appropriate. Thank you for your testimony. Um, then next up for neutral uh, is Brian Posler. Is he here? Thank you, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. I represent Lamar Advertising Company, one of the largest outdoor advertising companies in the world. We have over 363,000 displays across the US and Canada, and we employ over 3,500 people in communities all across the country. Um, we are currently neutral on SB 555 because we would be interested in seeing a medical marijuana program in the state, but we also have a vested interest in being able to advertise it on our outdoor displays. Um, so we would like to see uh, a program become law, but only if it is amended to allow our constitutionally protected commercial speech. So uh, our position is that section 13, if I could direct you to section 13 of the bill, um, it currently fails all four parts of the Supreme Court's 
uh, Central Hudson four-part test that they established in 1980 uh, on terms of determining what limits the state can apply on commercial speech. So first of all, uh, the government can, if they can demonstrate that it is lying, misleading, or involving illegal activity, it is fine to restrict. None of those apply here, so we uh, satisfy the first prong and have to look to the other three prongs. In that case, the government must prove a substantial interest in regulating the speech. And so even if you don't like billboards, we allow them for all sorts of other legal products, um, and so why not for this legal product? The third prong says that regulation must relate directly to the reason the speech needs to be limited. In this instance, section 13 of this bill as written allows advertising on the internet, but forbids other forms of communication, and we think that uh, by by fiat then violates this prong and therefore would be unconstitutional. Finally, the regulation must not be any more strict than absolutely necessary. Um, and so if the state has a legitimate interest in limiting billboards, we should have a conversation about the time, place, and manner that would be least intrusive and not, uh, it would be hard to come up with a more intrusive regulation than an outright ban on outdoor advertising as section 13 currently reads. So because it uh, fails all of these uh, prongs, uh, that is uh, severely damaging for this bill because it will likely not pass a constitutional test once that challenge is raised. The court has been absolutely adamant about enforcing this four-prong test. Uh, for example, uh, a Rhode Island law in 1996, 44 Liquor Mart versus Rhode Island, um, struck down a state law because the public has a right to learn about alcohol, uh, a considered undesirable product, but a legal product in the state of Rhode Island at that time, uh, similar to this bill. Also, a unanimous Supreme Court case ruled in Greater New Orleans Broadcasting Association, Inc. versus the U.S. in 1999 that a federal law banning radio and television advertisements for gambling could not be applied in states where gambling was now legal. So a similar circumstance again. So for all that reason, um, we think a very simple amendment would be in order. It would help us pass constitutional muster and uh, move us from being neutral to being full proponents for the bill. And so if we amend section 13 by striking the first line of section B, uh, that will leave all seven of the following regulations in place, but would allow us then to no longer be running afoul of those constitutional tests. Now, we've discussed this with some of the proponents of the bill. We think it will be viewed as um, a friendly amendment. And so we ask that you um, strike that one line and help us move forward with a better bill uh, should this bill move forward. Now, the one other piece of concern is that I can understand there might be a real vested interest in not having a lot of broadcast television and radio ads about medical marijuana. That makes sense to me as well. Um, this amendment would not open that door because those broadcast media are still governed by uh, the FCC, and so those restrictions remain in place for those media. Thank you. That's our five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also have neutral written only testimony from uh, about six different folks, available committee. Uh, so I'll open up questions very quickly for the neutral, uh, neutral testimony. Senator Fasquedo online. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the last uh, conferee, if he could come back to the podium. Um, so with some of your concerns, do you think this five-year pilot program would address some of those issues? And if you know during that time, what would we be looking for to know if this legislation or other legislation that might amendments that might go into the bill make it better what uh during that pilot program if you could elaborate yeah thank you senator for that question um we remain neutral on all of the bills that have uh, been advanced in recent years as possible medical marijuana programs we do think it could uh serve some important value for uh, individuals in the state. We just want to make sure it's as strong a bill as possible. And so, as I said, just the one little change in Section 13 uh, for my clients, uh, we think would be sufficient to help us move it forward. Although I'm sure you'll hear from lots of other opponents uh, about other changes that might be desirable for a program. Uh, but from our point of view, it's just about making sure that constitutionally protected speech uh, remains protected. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may, uh, ask that question to, to Jason Long, 
So during that five-year pilot um, program, that part of the legislation, what is it identified in the language in the bill of what we're looking for during that five years? Uh, Jason, I'm... I'm sorry, Senator, can you say what, what exactly are you looking sure. for? Uh, in your presentation, you said that uh, it this if this bill were to pass, it would be a five year pilot program. What are we looking for in that time to know if it works? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, there are um, provisions in the bill for reporting. So the contractors would make submit annual reports to the secretary that would include um, recommendations on improvements for the program. And the secretary is directed to annually report to the legislature and the governor and also submit recommendations for improvements to the program. And so I think uh, uh, any changes to the program would likely be based on, on those reports. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. We're gonna move on next to our opponent oral testimony. And again, we'll start the 20 minute clock up first, Senator Mark Steffen. Before we start, Mark Steffen, Senate District 34. But before we start, I do want to acknowledge Dr. Isinghoff. He provided pediatric care to both my children for years and years. And he was, he did an incredible job. He was a thoughtful, kind physician. And I have all the respect in the world for him. So thank you. He still can't start the clock. I'll tell you when. <laughs> I'm afraid it's running. So. <laughs> a couple of quick comments and as to what I heard throughout the uh, proponent speaking. You know, with my science cap on, with my physician cap on, I do not believe you can be serious or scientific in regards to marijuana, cannabis, whatever the term of the day is, if you don't talk about the specific molecule of THC involved in its side of action. And that research is still very infantile in its stage and has to be worked out. Uh, secondly, cannabis is an all encompassing term, marijuana, cannabis, it's an all encompassing term like cancer. You know, all cancers are tre diff treated different. The molecules within cannabis act differently, treat di things differently. That has to be kept in mind. From there, you know, senators, uh, please see my written testimony for precise details. What you're gonna hear, I think from the opponents today is the voice of experience. This may be a pilot program, but we've seen the crash site and we know what it looks like. So where there's, we're not predicting as we speak, we're more relating experiences and that's very, very important. SB 555 is problematic and broken in, in many ways, almost as if it's intentional. And what is clearly intentional is the end goal of the qualifying medical conditions listed on page three of the bill. This list contains many diagnoses of exclusion. That's a medical term, meaning that you cannot prove that a person has it or doesn't have it. It's basically completely subjective. As such, every person in Kansas can qualify for a marijuana card if they want to. This game played out for me back in the years about 2000 through 2010, the peak of my medical career, and it was directly within my specialty. Then the game was prescription narcotics, coupled to the idea that one's pain score was a new vital sign. Patients lied. Doctors eagerly, eagerly doled out huge amounts of narcotics. Patients died. Doctors went to jail. SB 555 is a new version of the same old game, but with two get out of jail free cards. Card number one is the potential of a Kansas statute making it legal. Card number two is legal immunity for the fo foolishly greedy prescribing individuals. 
Marijuana is an addictive drug. It hurts individuals. It destroys societies. It hurts societies. We have to be very calculated in this. We have to learn from experiences of other states, and we're going to get, get to hear that from the other te folks testifying. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor and Senator. Up next is Director Tony Mativi, Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Doctor, or uh, Director? <laughs> That's a, that was scary right there. Okay. <laughs> uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify. For the record, I am Tony Mativi. I'm the Director of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, and the KBI is strongly opposed to Senate Bill 555 for a number of reasons. Uh, as a preliminary matter, I'll point out that the three law enforcement organizations, the Chiefs Association, Sheriff's Association, and KPOA, Police Officers Association, have ceded their time to me. In return for, me trust, for them trusting me to be their voice, I would ask you to look at the written testimony that they have submitted, uh, which I adopt. I, I concur in and wholeheartedly agree with. They raise some outstanding points in that written testimony. For example, with I am very concerned, this is not what's driving my opposition today, but I'm very concerned by some of the trends and the data that we've seen as we look around the country at other states that have legalized. Um, as Sheriff uh, Easter points out in his written testimony, with respect to one of the proponents who pleads with you for a solution to the opioid epidemic, I join with him in that plea. But the data that we have seen from around the country is that states that have legalized medical marijuana have higher rates of opioid overdoses. So to the extent that he believes that this is some sort of cure for the opioid ep epidemic, I respectfully disagree with him, and I think the data disagrees as well. As Chief Braden Moore points out in his written testimony, one legalized marijuana is that the crime rates rise including the violent crime rate. So again, with respect to the proponent who says marijuana is not killing people, that may be true from a medical perspective, but it is driving an increase in violence in states and communities that legalize. And finally, my final preliminary matter, as Dr. Voth testified last session and may testify again today, one of the things that the data shows is, an incre is a correlation, a scientific correlation between increased THC availability to our youth and increased mental illness. And if there's one thing that I would think that we could all agree on, it's that we don't want to increase the availability of a substance that's going to increase the risk of mental illness in our young people. But that's not what's driving my testimony today. My testimony today is my greatest concern about this from the seat of the KBI director, and that is I believe legalization of cannabis in any form is an open invitation to organized crime to set up shop in our state. That's not something I believe. That's something that is apparent in the data as we look across the country. I'm going to quote for you from a letter that was written by 50 legislators, federal legislators, to Attorney General Merrick Garland February 2nd of last year, of, of this year, I'm sorry, just two months ago. And I provided that by email to the committee members. I have hard copies if anybody would like them. This was a bipartisan group of legislators from Democrats Gene Shaheen in New Hampshire and uh, a Democratic senator from New Mexico to independent Angus King to um, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Rick Scott. One of the legislators who signed that letter was our own U.S. First District Representative, Tracy Mann. Okay? But here's the letter. Dear Attorney General Garland, and I'm just going to take some quotes. We are deeply concerned with reports from across the country regarding Chinese nationals and organized crime cultivating marijuana on United States farmland. In some cases, the grow operators were also engaged in human trafficking, forced labor, drug trafficking, and violent crime. These farms are commonly seen in states with legal marijuana programs where illicit growers try to disguise their operations in communities where law-abiding Americans live and work. The thousands of illicit Chinese marijuana growing operations pose a direct threat to public safety, human rights, national security, and the addiction crisis gripping our nation. 
Chinese nationals, including those with potential ties to the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, are reportedly operating thousands of illicit marijuana farms across the country. A leaked Department of Homeland Security document from August of 2023 estimated Asian transnational criminal organizations are linked to up to 749 of these sites just in Maine and Washington State alone. Experts assert the number of farms funded by sources traceable back to Chinese investors or owners has skyrocketed, as have the presence of Chinese owners and workers at illegal grows. Experts believe there is substantial evidence implicating the CCP in directly supporting illicit marijuana grow operations across the United States. Most of these properties were acquired after recreational marijuana sales became legal in Maine. In Oklahoma, a state with over 2,300 medical dispensaries, over 2,000 marijuana farms are linked to China. According to the director of the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics, national and transnational criminals are moving this product on the black market and laundering money, millions of millions of dollars, back to China and other countries, which is funding terrorist and communist states. Sophisticated Chinese-affiliated marijuana operations have also been discovered in California, Washington, Oregon, Massachusetts, Michigan, and Nevada. In Colorado, a Chinese cartel bought suburban homes near Denver and grew thousands of marijuana plants in residential basements. Whether located in retrofitted residential homes or on farmland, state regulatory and law enforcement agencies appear unable to address these potentially CCP-supported grow operations despite their significant threat to local communities across the country. In this letter, those legislators asked Attorney General Garland for seven, asked him seven questions. They asked him to appear before them and provide answers to seven questions. Three of them are, how has state legalization of marijuana affected the proliferation of Chinese-affiliated marijuana farms? How much revenue do Chinese-affiliated marijuana farms in the United States generate, and how much of that is sent back to China, and through what mechanism? And how many Chinese-affiliated marijuana farms have obtained state-issued licenses to grow marijuana, either directly or through a shell company? I checked with Representative Mann yesterday and asked him what were the responses of Attorney General Garland to these requests, and the answer was there were no responses. I can tell you as a former federal prosecutor, when it comes to enforcing these laws and trying to keep our state safe from these sort of illicit grow operations, we are on our own. We can't depend on the feds for help. That's not because there aren't hardworking federal prosecutors in Kansas, I assure you there are, but that is not consistent with the agenda of the DOJ hierarchy in Washington. So this, this is going to fall for enforcement purposes on us, and we do not have the resources to take on organized criminal activity of this nature. Now the proponents have said things like, this is a tight bill. Right? With all of these rules, there, we learn from what happened around the country, there's no room for that here. Well, the hard part of that is criminals tend to not follow the rules. Right? And so if we open up that market, we are going to see organized criminal activity seep in. And that is the reason that I oppose Senate Bill 555. Thank you, Director. Up next, we have uh, Katie Wisman from Stand Up for Kansas. Katie, you've got about eight minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Katie Wisman, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear and speak today um, on behalf of Stand Up for Kansas in strong opposition to this bill. It has been touted for months as highly restrictive, conservative, and medically centric. But the devil is in the details, and this bill instead is dangerously broad, monopolistic, and unprecedented. I want to focus on new sections 42 through 44. So these are the statute, they amend statutes governing unlawful manufacture, distribution, and possession of controlled substances. Specifically, the exemptions in those uh, sections are not specific to cannabinoids, naturally derived from marijuana, as we might expect. As written, they extend to several different uh, targeted sections of statutes which establish schedules one through four in the Controlled Substances Act. I don't have time to talk through all of them, so I do want to summarize. The exemptions in Schedule 1 include a list of 54 hallucinogens with no demonstrated medical value and a high potential for abuse. Some of these include MDMA, which you might know as the date rape drug, 
LSD, psilocybin, psilocin, which are both um, psychedelics found in shrooms, and also a number of 25 in-bomb compounds, uh, which are synthetic hallucinogens associated with severe intoxication and death. Also in Schedule 1, there are exemptions for two fentanyl analogs, which are used in the illegal production of fentanyl. The exemptions in Schedules 2 and 3 are specific to the currently FDA-approved medications that contain cannabis, uh, I'm sorry, cannabinoid uh, derivatives and are available by prescription. And Schedule 4 contains exemptions from five specific subsections that include a number of weight loss drugs, and two, including two that have been withdrawn from the U.S. market because of patient safety concerns. Uh, Schedule 4 exemptions also include synthetic opioid analgesics used to treat pain and several stimulants used um, as appetite suppressants to treat obesity, ADHD, and narcolepsy. In sum, the amendments in those sections surreptitiously allow operators and laboratories to manufacture and distribute 79 controlled substances and their analogs. Now, importantly, nothing in this bill establishes a limit on the amount of THC that can be contained in medical cannabis products. And pursuant to the exclusions that I just talked about, there is no prohibition against any of those particular Schedule 1, 2, 3, or 4 compounds from being added to medical cannabis products and distributed to unsuspecting patients. Functionally, this would allow operators and contracted laboratories to operate as state-sanctioned clan labs, manufacturing and distributing an unprecedented list of dangerous drugs when contained in a medical cannabis product. The possibilities are endless, so I want to give just a couple examples. If somebody needs help losing weight, perhaps they might manufacture and distribute a tincture containing THCV, which has been dubbed diet weed, um, and add lorcaserin, which is a weight loss drug withdrawn from the U.S. market in 2020 because of concerns with cancer. If someone suffers from chronic pain, perhaps they might produce and sell a transdermal patch with full spectrum THC and a little butorphanol, which is a synthetic opioid analgesic used to treat pain. If this sounds dangerous, it is, and these are not hyperboles. So think also about the exclusions that you heard from the child in need of care cases and the, the types of schedule, uh, one, two, three, and four substances that these products might contain and those can't be considered when judges are evaluating child in need of care. This is far more than a medical cannabis bill. It allows for the creation of a new and unique uh, brand of designer drugs that can be distributed by a single group of developers, and there will be no pharmacy model. I don't have time to get into that. No pun intended, but this bill is a recreational vehicle. Notably, if it were to become law as written, Kansas would become the ninth state to legalize psychedelic drug use so long as the psychedelics were contained in a medical cannabis product. If the charge of this committee is for policymakers to, quote, deliver real medicine while avoiding the myriad of problems other states have experienced, end quote, no legislative action is necessary. There are real medicines that exist today, and they're attached to my testimony. Characterizing this as highly restrictive, conservative, and medically centric is, in my opinion, not only an absurd misrepresentation, it's a shrewd attempt to gain broad support before late introduction of this bill. This is an expansive and dangerous drug legalization proposal that is arguably among the most broad nationally. It will create a recreational market and it will wreak havoc on Kansas. When anyone understands the full implications of this bill, I just, I cannot understand how anyone would support it. So I pray that you will categorically reject Senate Bill 555. Thank you, Katie. Up next is uh, Kelsey Olson from the Kansas Department of Ag. Kelsey, we're down to about uh, two and a half minutes. I will be very brief. Uh, Chairman Thompson, members of the committee, I'm Kelsey Olson. I serve as the Deputy Secretary for the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Um, I want to make it clear that the Department of Agriculture does not have a position on marijuana in Kansas, medical or otherwise. However, KDA does believe that this bill may be problematic in regard to its potential effects on the industrial hemp program. Senate Bill 555 essentially requires at least one employee to have previously held a hemp license as a hemp grower. 
This requirement is in direct conflict with the United States Department of Agriculture rules, which strictly prohibits a hemp producer from growing any type of marijuana. Once the hemp licensee begins producing medical cannabis, they could no longer grow industrial hemp without having violated the USDA final rule. KDA has already seen a dramatic decrease in licensees in the industrial hemp program, and we believe this would further reduce the number. Secondly, by requiring an approved medical cannabis operator to have previously held a hemp license implies that growing hemp qualifies someone to grow cannabis. These two plants will require different agronomic approaches. Most Kansas hemp producers grow for fiber production. These hemp plants are planted outdoors in traditional crop fields. Medical cannabis will necessitate that plants are grown indoors with numerous environmental controls as well as adequate security. KDA has heard repeatedly from constituents who are confused by the distinction between hemp and cannabis. KDA believes that the connections created in this bill will only reinforce the confusion and misconceptions while posing risks to the industrial hemp program. I'd also like to note that Senate Bill 555 allows a cannabis producer to contract with a licensed hemp processor for processing. Hemp processors are not technically licensed. They are registered with the state fire marshal, um, and there are very few requirements, primarily building codes, for the registered processors. But by allowing them to have the ability to process both hemp as well as uh, medical cannabis potentially in the same facility potentially causes there to be um, cross um, contamination or um, conflicts when the two products are co mingled. So, with that, um, we could easily be neutral if um, there were the connections with hemp were removed, but we'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. I'm afraid we're out of time for that 20 minute block. Um, I apologize we didn't get to Dr. Voth, Phyllis Schechtel, Juanita Ramos, Kelly Ripple, or Thomas Gordon. And there are 25 opponent written only testimony, um, uh, testimony available uh, to the committee here. And I failed to mention off the top, although Senator Erickson noted that there's a, a fairly hefty fiscal note that we should all review uh, before we get um, to any consideration. Uh, so I'm going to open it now to um, any questions for our opponents and uh, anyone who'd like to start. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, this is for Katie Wisman. Katie, you had mentioned in your testimony that the pharmacy distribution model isn't more than likely going to come to fruition, and that seems to be a key component of this bill. So can you explain now why that may be? Yes, thank you for the question. I believe it's section eight um, that talks about the pharmacy distribution model and uh, requiring KDHE to evaluate that. And if it were not able to come to fruition, then it would fall back to the operators to operate those distribution hubs. So attached to my testimony is um, a letter that the DEA's Diversion Control Division um, actually sent to Georgia pharmacies back in November. Um, and so just for context, uh, Georgia passed a medical cannabis law a few years ago that allows their state independent pharmacies to dispense medical cannabis oil with up to 5% THC cap to registered patients. So that DEA diversion control um, division letter to those Georgia pharmacies indicated that because they're dispensing and handling controlled substances, they're required to be licensed with the DEA. And certain provisions of that licensure require compliance with federal law, which says marijuana is illegal. Um, so essentially it notified them that it's illegal for those pharmacies to participate in the program. The other thing I wanna mention, not included in my testimony, but um, just yesterday, actually Senator Romney, who chairs the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, yeah, Senate Foreign Relations Committee 
penned a letter to the DEA um, arguing that rescheduling of marijuana would violate not only the Controlled Substances Act federally, but also U.S. treaty obligations. So I think it's just important to understand that this whole pharmacy model coming to fruition is predicated upon either changes at the federal level, uh, changes at the federal level in compliance with federal law. So essentially that means section eight, pharmacies aren't going to be able to participate and it will revert back to the operators. Okay. Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question's for um, Tony Mativi, the director of the KBI. Um, could we possibly get some numbers on um, DUI and DWI involving um, marijuana use, um, opioids, alcohol, everything? Um, I'm just wanting to kind of gather some information on um, how our patrol officers are getting people that may be under the influence off the street and not causing harm to others. We can, Senator. It's not anything I have with me today, but sure. may I get with you afterwards and we'll clarify specifically what you're looking for and we'll be happy to go gather that data for you and share it with the committee. Absolutely. Right, thank you. you. I'll send it over to Sheila and she can distribute that um, when, when you get it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Clouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This was for uh, Tony Mativi as well. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Along this journey, uh, when we've had these different uh, committee meetings, uh, we talked about agency readiness, and that's always something I'm concerned about, whether it's law enforcement agencies or uh, ABC or whatever we're trying to uh, legislate. Uh, you still, even in light of this, seem to have big hesitancy that the agency would uh, be ready for something like this. So people ask me, <clears throat> you know, I'm 14 months into this job and people still ask me what's the biggest surprise that I found at the KBI. And the biggest surprise has been how under-resourced, understaffed we are compared to the demands out there from our constituents and our customers for what we do. Uh, we have to prioritize because we just don't have the resources to do everything that we need to do on a statewide basis. So we prioritize violent crime, crimes against children, public corruption, and drugs, and right now that means fentanyl. When I talk to my counterparts in Oklahoma, one of the things I hear, for example, is the last four wiretap operations that the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics went up on were marijuana grow operations run by Chinese nationals. Okay, the resources involved in doing a wiretap are immense, and trying to do a wiretap in a foreign language makes that exponentially greater. The idea of trying to add that to our priorities that we're taking on, what that means is every time a sheriff or a police chief from somewhere in Kansas calls and asks the KBI for help with an investigation, a major investigation in their county, we're gonna have to say no to more of those so that we can do these kinds of investigations because we know these will be a priority because of the amount of havoc that they wreak in communities across Kansas. So that's the basis for my hesitancy, Senator. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Next, uh, Senator Blasey on Webex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is for uh, Dr. Voth. Um, you know, we heard earlier by a neutral uh, conferee that this bill really isn't, quote, medical. And so I'm just curious, you know, I re recently read a study how cannabis is actually uh, harmful to people who experience PTSD. And so I'm curious, is there any medical or scientific studies that have shown any positive effects of using cannabis? Uh, if we had about three or four hours, I could go through that in great detail, but I'm going to negate some of the positive comments that came in. First off, there now is solid evidence that marijuana is also exacerbating PTSD. Um, psychosis, suicide, violent behavior is all being seen and actually seen in the upswing since a lot of these can cannabis preparations have been coming out, we're seeing huge uh, increases in the, uh, in the amount of THC. And one of the examples of that is what's proposed here for the legislature at 35%. Consider this, if you think of a cigarette or a joint, that's about a gram weight. 
So if 35% of that can be THC, that's 350 milligrams. And if we did, got into things like, uh, you know, some of the vapes and that kind of thing that are 70 to 80, 90%, that's 700 to 900 milligrams. Now I want to compare that to Marinol, which is on the market, prescribable, Schedule 3, I can write you a script for it right now today, and it's been out for several years. It is cannabis, pure cannabis, THC, dronabinol, and it's available, and it works. And in my written testimony, I've got about three or four pages that brought the actual circular from, from Marinol to you to look at how it can be used, but also its toxic side effects, precautions, etc. And this is, mind you, for five to 10 milligrams of THC, not 300, not 900. So when you're looking at the net effect on society, you gotta back up here and realize that what this bill is doing is trying to put toxic substances on the market. And, I, and I'm extremely concerned about that. The other point, to your point, that I, I wanna add 40 years ago, <clears throat> I remember listening to a presentation by the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, and they said, we intend to use the medicinal applications of marijuana to get the camel's nose under the tent. And so far, all of the states that have fully legalized cannabis started with medical pot, and that's where we're trying to head here in Kansas. If you look at the allowed uh, other substances, uh, the, you know, there's immunity for, uh, for criminal behaviors, there's immunity for other drugs, uh, and, I, and I think we're just opening a Pandora's box. So rather than open this Pandora's box, if there are providers like us that actually take care of pain, and I was a pain provider for many years, you can turn to a wide variety of other effective medicines or, if you think that cannabis products are going to be necessary, you can try Marinol. It's not a wonder drug. I've prescribed it for patients. Some benefit, not a huge amount. But you don't need what's being laid out in this, in this legislation. I hope I answered all your question. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, up next, uh, Senator Fascado. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to play devil's advocate. Uh, I have a question for Sherry. Um, I, I believe, is that Sherry who testified? Uh, no, um, which, which, who are you, who are you looking for, Senator Fascado? Uh, the previous conferee, the, the female. Um, oh, uh, uh, Katie Wisman. Katie, yes, yes, yes. Okay. I'm sorry, Katie. Um, so plain devil's advocate. Um, you know, I've sat through these hearings for many years and even interim committee meetings, uh, hearing about what other states are doing. And just the other day in the Senate Federal and State Affairs Committee, there was another uh, medical marijuana bill introduced. And I'm sure uh, in the future, other bills will be introduced. Do you think um, on behalf of your clients, is there a compromise? Is there something that Kansas, uh, everybody who's in the room, proponents, opponents could do to address this issue uh, since it just keeps coming up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Katie? Yes, thank you for the question, Senator Fauscado. Uh, I think since 2013, this is the 53rd bill that I've reviewed line by painstaking line that deals with something CBD, hemp, marijuana, or THC related. Um, so I appreciate your question. And what I would tell you is uh, from my client's perspective, we stand by the FDA approval process. We won't sub, uh, support anything that subverts the FDA approval process because those clinical trials are rigorous. Um, they, they do the science, the research, uh, they, they study the dosing recommendations, they make sure that there's um, efficacy for treatment of certain conditions with certain prescribed amounts of certain, uh, certain drugs. So 
Um, in terms of compromise, I, I, that's our position, and I don't see our position changing much from supporting FDA-approved medications that contain uh, cannabinoids. Uh, Katie, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the response. Yeah. Katie, can I, uh, while you're on that FDA approval process, I do have one question with regard to how they do it. They use a five-factor system. But what they're talking about in this delisting now is discarding that and going to a two-factor system that's more political. In other words, saying that because a number of states are using it, that is proof that there is medical use. Can you speak to that? I, I'm probably not the right person to speak perhaps to that. Dr. Or, Voth, perhaps uh, Dr. Voth. Perhaps Dr. Voth or Dr. Stefan. Yes, that's a concern. Part of that is intentional to try to subterfuge and make this happen a little more quickly. I, I think it could still be used and it would still give me the same result uh, in, in what I stand for. And um, I don't know that it would necessarily make a huge change at a federal level. But I would say the initial intent, as, as best I can tell from what I've been seeing and reading, is to try to shrink the requirements down to make it easier uh, to get things through. And you know, honestly, we don't want the FDA, FDA to have an easy time to get drugs on the market. Uh, I've done research for pharmaceutical companies, I've participated in all sorts of research, and you want it to be rigorous, you want there to be no question the effects and the efficacy. Uh, so I'd be totally opposed to anything that streamlines that, or like Kansas or, or, or state legislation uh, bypassing it. I think that's a total mistake. And I'd add one last thing. I included in my written testimony about three or four pages straight out of uh, the pharmaceutical research on Marinol, and it really goes into, into detail uh, as to the potential side effects also. Thank you. I, I saw that. That's got some very, we're talking about a small dosage, but still similar side effects with the uh, I think Senator Holscher is online with a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my question is for Kelly Ripple. Okay. Um, my question is this: With I don't, I don't know if Kelly's in the room right now. I think he was one of the individuals. He's in the back that... room. There, here he okay. is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think he was supposed to testify, but we ran out of time. Um, Correct. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, my question is this, with I believe 40 other states having medicinal cannabis programs in place, I'm trying to figure out really the need for the pilot program. And I do appreciate that uh, the Deputy Secretary Olson pointed out that you know, hemp and medicinal cannabis have very different uh, cultivation methods. So can you help me understand kind of what's going on there? And like I said, the need for a pilot program? Yes, uh, Senator Holscher, thank you for the question, and uh, Chairman Thompson, com com committee members, thank you for uh, allowing me to come up and speak. The pilot program model um, is something that um, we would all like to see happen based on just the need for regulation for cannabis products. Uh, there has really only been, to my knowledge, one other pilot program that was instituted in the U.S. as far as cannabis goes, and that did include things like patient cultivation and things like that. So we're really not talking about the same thing. Um, it's, we're really kind of comparing apples and, and oranges with regards to uh, Senate Bill 555. Um, I did want to just address, though, in my written testimony, Cannabis does provide a kind of a unique opportunity for regulations because if, if you look at the bell curve, we have all of the scheduled narcotics on one end that are highly illegal. And then on the other side, we have something like profit, profit-driven regulations, meaning alcohol, tobacco, and really regulating cannabis gives us an opportunity to protect public health and utilize the evidence, and as spoken earlier, the lessons, uh, both good and bad, from other states. So as far as um, a limited pilot program, there are concerns that uh, when you legalize or regulate, that gives a notion that it is legal. Um, 
but if it's only allowed for a certain people to participate, certain people, enough people to have access to it, it can cause concerns. I also want to bring up one other point about that was brought up. Um, Kansas already has billboards and advertising for cannabis. I don't know if anyone knows, but there's a billboard north of Wichita that's advertising for cannabis 160 miles away in Kansas City, Missouri. So um, there, there does need to be, I think, some, some thought to uh, what we have as far as regulations, but because the legislature has unfortunately not regulated cannabis products, Kansas has one of the most saturated, unregulated markets for cannabinoid products. And so all of that really is an example or reason to regulate. And there's been a lot of speak about um, correlation not really being causality, but uh, as far as Oklahoma goes, their program was done through a ballot initiative. And um, I think this really gives us an opportunity to uh, put some evidence behind some of the regulations that we want to see moving forward. Senator Erickson. Oh, oh, I thought you had a question. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page 22 of the bill, um, about halfway down the page, line 19, it says a patient shall not purchase medical cannabis um, or medical cannabis products in an amount that exceeds in the aggregate of 200 grams um, of products or unprocessed medical cannabis flour or 3.47 grams of tetrahydrocannabinol contained in any medical cannabis product during any 30-day period of time. And I'm looking at the Kansas Department of Agriculture industrial hemp um, uh, regulations of 0.3%. It may not contain THC concentration of, of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. Um, Usually I can do math, but I'm struggling to understand what amount of THC, THC content, how are we measuring this, what's, what's legal and what's not currently. Maybe um, Tony Mativi or um, uh, maybe the state fire marshal could help out. I'm not sure. Doctor. I'm trying to figure out how much can any one person um, be in possession of at a time and be, be considered legal under this bill or how much horse bedding or uh, hemp products can I be in possession of and not exceed a certain amount of THC? Senator, I, uh, I appreciate your confidence in me, but I am nowhere near smart enough to answer that question. Uh, I do, though, have one of our very uh, bright, capable forensic scientists here in the room, and if you would permit me to have uh, Patrick Perubsky come up here, I think he might be able to address that. Is that permissible, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Just threw you under the bus. <laughs> and if you could speak also uh, to, you know, how that relates to a 30-day supply, you know, how, how much are they able to have? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, to, so to go to your question first about um, hemp, um, in the hemp statutes in Kansas, um, it's unlawful to distribute um, hemp uh, material, flower material, to any individual that's not a licensed processor. Um, so right now, no flower material of hemp is allowed by Kansas citizens if they're not a licensed processor. Um, in this case, with the 200 grams of uh, flower material um, that's allowed under this, um, like Dr. Both mentioned, um, just as a matter of quantity um, for scale, even though this is not allowed to smoke in this bill, um, that one marijuana joint uh, anecdotally is between 0.3 grams and one gram of marijuana. Um, so this would categorize as uh, 200 of those in uh, 30 days. Um, as far as the amount of uh, 3.47 grams of THC contained in uh, medical cannabis products, the confusing part of that is that it's not using the same terms that are defined earlier um, in this bill, where it defines THC content. Um, THC content is both the amount of THC present plus 87.7% of the THC acid that's present. Um, when the plant actually produces THC, the plant produces it as THC acid first, and then with time and with heat, that THC acid breaks down into THC. So to measure the amount of THC that would be in a plant material or in a product, it'd be important to measure both of those and to take that into account into the total amount of THC that would be potentially in that product 
Um, and in this portion of the bill, the 3.47 grams of THC contained in the medical cannabis product, uh, it's totally ignoring the THC acid. So that potentially could be any amount of THC acid that someone would want for a 30-day supply. That was comprehensive. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are, we're coming up on 10 o'clock and, and probably time to wrap things up here. I probably have time for one more. Senator Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do appreciate um, all of the information that's been shared with us today. And through this, it has become abundantly clear to me that this is not the conservative, restricted control pilot program it's being characterized as. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would move that we table this until January 13th, 2025. I will... Um Allow that motion. Uh, it's non-debatable. We do need a second. Is there a second on that? Second by Senator Clues. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate all the testimony today. Very uh, ex extensive. We are uh, done and we are adjourned. Thank you.